These are genuine ads from the past. If you have a sensitive nature, some of these ads may disturb you. These are ads of the past that would be banned today. This cigarette, Testerfield King, gives all the advantages of extra length and much more. The great taste of 21 vintage tobaccos grown mild, aged mild, and blended mild. No wonder they satisfy so completely. One of the oldest ways to market something is through testimonials. In most of the early tobacco ads, beautiful upper-class men and women were shown smoking. By the 1930s, tobacco companies were paying famous people, especially movie stars, to advertise their products. In the 1950s and 60s, famous TV stars were also used. Then, in 1964, it became illegal for tobacco companies to use famous people to help sell their products, and cigarette advertising shifted to more ordinary people. Some ads mixed superstars with everyday people to show that you might smoke the same cigarette as your favorite movie star or sports hero. The individuals in cigarette advertisements were far from average though, since almost all of the men and women were young, thin, gorgeous, and having a fantastic time. This flat tire needs a man, but when there's no man around, Goodyear should be. Oh, the perks of being a woman. Cooking, cleaning, waiting on your man. Then, when you have the time, focus on getting that sexy shape that every man wants. During World War II, women were portrayed as workers, but after the war, they were almost always shown as housewives or sex objects. In the 1960s and 70s, as more women went to work and the women's liberation movement grew, ads started to show a glamorized version of the working woman called the New Woman or Superwoman. Even though almost half of the workforce was made up of women by the 1970s, ads hadn't yet gotten the message. On the one hand, women's roles in ads didn't change much at all. Women were still thought of as housewives and sex objects. Advertisers often showed women modeling clothes or doing housework, while men were almost never shown outside of the workplace. On the other hand, when the working woman was shown, it was usually in a way that was unrealistic and glamorized. This new woman was not only expected to do well at work, but also to keep up with her chores at home and make her husband happy. Happy Aunt Jemima, famous for her secret recipe, pancakes, waffles, and buckwheat. What's a good word, Aunt Jemima? Well, Mr. Lyon, folks says there's nothing so pretty as a happy face and nothing so worthwhile as a happy life. Yes, Aunt Jemima, that is true. Racism has been a part of advertising for a long time. When black people were shown in ads, they were almost always shown as being submissive, ignorant, and unattractive. From the late 1800s, when African Americans first appeared in ads, they were often portrayed in a bad light or made fun of. Products had cartoonish pictures of black people, and bleach and soap brands joked that their products could lighten dark skin and that dark skin was considered dirty. Aunt Jemima has one of the longest running ads for a ready-mix self-rising flower and illustrates a stereotypical mammy. The character was based on a vaudeville performer who sang Aunt Jemima while wearing an apron and a bandana scarf. The mammy figure continued to appear in 20th century television shows, radio, clothes, memorials, pancake boxes, and syrup bottles. Amazingly, Quaker Oats didn't redesign Aunt Jemima until 1989 and the brand name was finally discontinued in 2021. With the civil rights movement in the 1960s, more advertisers realized that people of different races were also consumers. That brought about more diversity in advertising as companies finally began to realize that there was more money to be made by including minorities in their ads. I was overweight and looked terrible, but AIDS helped me lose 46 pounds. The AIDS diet plan helped me lose 28 pounds. AIDS helps control your appetite so you lose weight, yet AIDS lets you taste, chew, and enjoy. And the appetite suppressant in AIDS is not a stimulant. 
AIDS helped me to lose 18 pounds, and it doesn't contain anything to make me nervous. Question, why take diet pills when you can enjoy AIDS? AIDS helps you lose weight without making you jittery. In the 1800s, there was no Food and Drug Administration to keep track of what health products could say in their advertising. Because of that, a popular market for so-called patent medicines grew. Manufacturers of these medicines often made false claims and kept their full ingredient lists and formulas secret. But we now know that they often contained addictive ingredients like cocaine, opium, morphine, and alcohol. Products like cough drops with heroin, toothache medicine with cocaine, and asthma-relieving cigarettes were sold over-the-counter with the help of colorful ads. There were no federal laws regulating the sale of drugs like morphine or cocaine before the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1914. Even in states that had rules about selling drugs as early as the 1880s, those rules were not part of the criminal code and the laws that were in place weren't strictly enforced. A person who was addicted to morphine could take the same old worn-out prescription to a druggist who would fill it again and again. Who has six fingers? <laughs> Shoots rockets that burst and bombs that explode and writes with a pen and signals in code. Shoots message missiles and watch them go. And it looks like your finger and how will they know? Six fingers, six fingers, six fingers. Here's how to get it on the card right there. Less than two dollars everywhere. Six finger, six finger, man alive. How did I ever get along with five? Many people worry about how much advertising their kids see. With the rise of Saturday morning cartoons in the 1960s and children's programming on TV, we tend to think that ads aimed at kids were a fairly new thing. But at the beginning of the 20th century, advertisers started selling to kids instead of their parents. In the early 1900s, companies like the Winchester Rifle Company started contests to get people to use their products. By the late 1920s, kids could join clubs and could qualify for prizes if they used the product more. Some companies advertised their products on radio shows and even in schools, using school officials as an endorsement. By the mid-1900s, there were many different ways for advertisers to market to kids. Most American homes already had TVs, and in 1953, the first shows for preschoolers were broadcast. At the same time, companies ran ads for bikes, games, and other things in popular comic books. Food companies would publish cookbooks that taught kids how to cook using their products. And in 1963, McDonald's started using the clown Ronald McDonald as their mascot in an effort to target children. Advertisers also looked at the most recent psychological studies to find the best advertising method to reach children and young adults. You know, this was me five years ago, and it's still me. But I confess, I'm a waistline watcher from way back. Well, that's enough for today. Now for a lively lift. Ice-cold Coca-Cola. There's no waistline worry with Coke, you know. Actually, this individual size bottle has no more calories than half a grapefruit. Body shaming has been going on for a long time. The perfect body image movement really started at the beginning of the 1900s. Media and ads began to show more and more pictures of the perfect female body in order to make it easier to sell their fat reducing or, in some cases, fat gaining products. The perfect body for both men and women is influenced by the media and also by changes in the way that society decides what the ideal body type should be. People often have the wrong idea about body shaming. Many people think that it means making fun of people who are overweight but studies show that body shaming also happens to people who are too thin by setting beauty and body standards that are unobtainable for most people. If you made it this far, hit that subscribe button below. It really does help me out. And let me know your thoughts about these ads from the past in the comments below. Until next time, this is Rich from Rerun Zone, signing off.